In the mid to late 1800s, about 55 of my ancestors left England and Wales, crossed the ocean to America, and then by train or by ox cart or ship or a combination of all three, made their way to Utah as converts to the Mormon church. In April of 2017, I joined my father and we took a trip in reverse back to the homeland of England and Wales to retrace some of the footsteps and visit some of the sites of these ancestors from long ago. The trip was about half family history research and half sightseeing. We focused primarily on three areas of family interest here from left to right, the Pembroke area, Stratford-upon-Avon and Coventry, and South London, but sprinkled in a little bit of sightseeing along the way, St. David's on the coast of Wales, uh, Bath and Blenheim Palace, a trip through the Cotswolds as well. It was a wonderful trip. For the next hour or so, I'm going to take you back across the same journey that we went through, learning a bit about my family and about some of the things we discovered along the way. I'm going to start with a brief overview of the families involved in the family history part of this journey. I took this picture of this tree in Cautiston, Wales. It's in a field behind a church where several of my ancestors were baptized, married, and uh, possibly buried. It's uh, St. Michael and All Angels Church in Cautiston, Wales. And I, I just think it's an interesting tree, and I'm going to use it as a metaphor for the family tree. If I look at myself at the base of the tree, then, of course, my father, Lyle Goodwin, and his parents, uh, one was a Goodwin and his mother was a purser, and these two branches of the tree or the, are the primary branches that we went to discover when we were on our trip. But let's go up the Goodwin side first. <clears throat> my, my grandfather, Alfred Goodwin, um, his father, of course, was uh, Goodwin, but his mother was a Wickham. And uh, the Wickhams and the Grahams, uh, further up the line, all lived in South London. But there are other families uh, that uh, continue in the line, in that Wickham-Graham line, that I just don't have listed here because they weren't the focus of our our trip. Uh, but they are all from um, Sussex. And, and some, actually, there's a branch in Scotland as well. It was out of scope for this trip, so it's sort of, I kept it off of this picture. My grandfather, Alfred Goodwin's paternal line, of course, went up to Goodwin's, and this this group of people, uh, the Goodwin's and then uh, the various maternal families that married into the Goodwin line are the Chambers and the Jacksons, and then the Chambers uh, line uh, comes from Trotman's, and they're all from the Stratford-upon-Avon area, uh, which is north of London by about 80 miles. Uh, we spent some time there, and we'll spend some time uh, in this video going through what we discovered there. Uh, a lot of rich history from the Goodwin line of the family, as well as um, these others. My father's mother was a purser, and the pursers are from Wales. Um, her father was born in Wales. The pursers come from the Pembrokeshire area in southwest Wales. Uh, and there, if you go up the line there from the Pursers, they, the Nashes married into the Pursers and also the, the Anans married into the Pursers. So we spent some time researching and visiting them as well while we were on our trip. And then there's another branch of my grandmother's family. Um, her father was a Purser. Her mother was a Bigler. And uh, the Biglers were from Virginia for many, many generations, like back to the um, 1600s. So... They were not part of this particular trip. This trip we focused on just our English and Welsh heritage. Members of each branch of my family tree joined the Mormon church during its explosive growth in Great Britain from the period of 1837 through about 1859. They joined at different times and for different reasons and participated in the massive Mormon migration of the 19th century. Of the 120,000 who had been baptized since 1837, nearly half of them emigrated to Utah. That includes seven families that converted to Mormonism in my direct line. And if you include all the children that also converted, uh, 37 people who converted to Mormonism in England or Wales and then followed their faith to Utah in the 19th century. 
the immigration of UK Mormons to Zion was so profound that its legacy can still be seen today. Utah has the highest percentage of people of English ancestry in the United States, 29%, and of the cities in America with the highest percentage of English ancestry, 16 of the top 20 are in Utah. Let's get started talking about C.C. Goodwin, Charles Clifford Goodwin, my great-great-grandfather. Charles Clifford, I'll call him C.C. probably for the rest of this. Uh, He went by C.C. during his life as well. C.C. was what we in the Goodwin family like to call a character. Uh, He was a convert to the church in England. Uh, We'll go over all that. And uh, we visited the sites of his upbringing and uh, also where he met his wife. And so we'll show you that as well. What I'm not going to spend time on this video showing you is the rest of his life, which is equally as fascinating. And uh, I, I documented that in a biography of him that I wrote that you can find on my website. For example, after migrating from England as a Mormon immigrant, Um, He became disaffected with the Mormon church in Utah. He entered politics uh, because he was angry at the way he'd been treated and uh, returned to his Episcopalian roots. He also became a uh, U.S. United States commissioner at the time and uh, really struck terror into the hearts of Utah's polygamists for many years before then retiring and running what was either a raisin farm or a grape vineyard in Fresno for the last few years of his life. So well worth reading about. We're just going to spend time talking about his upbringing and uh, his conversion and then uh, his uh, departure from England. C.C. Goodwin is my great great grandfather uh, and uh, here's a picture of sort of the family tree or the relevant portions for our discussion right now. Um, You see me to my dad to my grandfather and my great grandfather. All of the people on that bottom color, the green color, those are um, people who were born in America. The white boxes with the red, those are ancestors who converted to Mormonism, and then the the lighter color green up, up above, those are ancestors who did not convert to Mormonism. It's probably worth noting here that C.C. Goodwin's son, Harry Goodwin, uh, born in the United States, married Alice Wickham, also born in the United States. But Alice Wickham's parents were also Mormon immigrants who were converted in London in the 1800s and you know came to utah and the wickham family is the focus of let's call it chapter three of this video that i'm putting together so we will return to alice wickham and her family three of the people on this chart were born and lived much of their lives in stratford upon avon stratford upon avon is also of course the birthplace of william shakespeare who was born and lived there and has died and buried there and so the three people on this chart who were whose lives centered around Stratford upon Avon are C.C. Goodwin, his wife Phoebe Chambers, and C.C. Goodwin's mother Jane Jackson. We went to Stratford upon Avon as a central part of this trip and walked the streets and visited the homes where these people had lived all those many years ago. For whatever reason I really love this map from 1905. It would be as recognizable to C.C. and his family in the mid-1800s as it is to modern residents, and we used it as the map for our walking tour of Stratford-on-Avon. Stratford is a very walkable town. We stayed in the Stratford Hotel, which is shown here on this map as a hospital, because in fact back in 1905 it was a hospital. Uh, but uh, we would walk into town for all of the activities. The, the, I guess the three major areas worth pointing out to you before we get into it is Shakespeare's birthplace on Henley Street, uh, which is the main pedestrian and uh, tourist area of the town. Down on the river is the Royal Shakespeare Theater, where we attended a play. And then you'll notice down at the bottom of the map is the Holy Trinity Church, which figures prominently in the life of the Goodwin family. Uh, There were also several of their homes down in that area, and I'll point those out later in our tour. So here we are on Henley Street. Um, It's a, as I mentioned, it's a touristy area, lots of shops and little uh, boutiques and whatnot. It's, of course, most famous for having the Shakespeare home on it, which you see right here. Uh, It is the house that William Shakespeare was born in and he was raised in it. We did go inside. There's, You can buy a ticket and go in and get a tour of the inside of the house. We chose to just walk through it. And uh, I'm not sure it was there was anything that special about it, except it was an opportunity to sort of get a sense for what a house was like back in the 1500s. Okay, everyone's so excited all around me because that is Shakespeare's birthplace. This is where Shakespeare was born, lived with his family, and also lived in this town and street. But right across the street, 
is the home of your great 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 grandmother, Phoebe. Wait, what? C.C. Goodwin's wife, Phoebe, grew up in the house across the street from Shakespeare's house? Well, that's almost a true story. Uh, Phoebe Chambers is the daughter of Clifford Chambers and Elizabeth Trotman. They were eventually divorced, and Elizabeth Trotman remarried a man named Cotterell Ballard. And that couple lived in the house. It was after Phoebe Chambers uh, had been married. Phoebe was married at the age of 16 and moved out. Uh, but uh, soon thereafter, Elizabeth Trotman and Cotterell Ballard uh, lived in this building right here. And in fact, it was also used as the meeting house for the local branch of the Mormons. And there's Grandpa Lyle. Brad? You just came out of Phoebe's home. Any comments to the kids? Um. <laughs> Is that good enough? Yeah. And there we are standing in front of number 41 Henley Street, the former home of Cotterell Ballard and Elizabeth Ballard, and also the meeting place of the LDS Church. I had a chance to go in the store, which is now, as you can see, an Edinburgh woolen mill store, and uh, look inside and see the timber frames, the original timber frames that uh, the, the clerk in there said had been uh, brought in from uh, ships that had sunk, and the oak frames of those ships were reused as the framing for this particular building. I love this picture that Peggy took from the upstairs window of the Ballard House looking back at the Shakespeare House. I also took the chance to buy a tie there as long as I was in the store. Down at the end of Henley Street is the Avon River itself, which is lovely strolling areas. The Royal Shakespeare Company Theater is there, and we actually got tickets to go see a play there, Antony and Cleopatra, one evening. I've never been a huge fan of Shakespeare, uh, and was especially worried when we saw this sign. <laughs> but uh, the play itself was really well done. The theater is beautiful and amazing. And, I mean, can you really go to Shakespeare's hometown and not see a play by Shakespeare? Next, we walked south along the shore of the Avon River towards the iconic Holy Trinity Church, which is the place where Shakespeare is buried, and also holds a great deal of importance in the Goodwin family history. The timing was just right that an organ concert was happening in the church as we got there, so I'll let some of that play behind my commentary. Here we are in the chancel. There's the Shakespeare family members are buried there. And a lot of people are not aware, but the reason why Shakespeare is buried here in the church is not because he's the favored son of Stratford-upon-Avon, but because back when King Henry VIII cut off funding to the churches, Shakespeare bought a share in the church and thus had the right to be buried in it. Holy Trinity Church was the church where C.C. Goodwin and his siblings were baptized and attended church. C.C. eventually was uh, converted to Mormonism, but his family stayed in Stratford and continued to attend the Holy Trinity Church and to be part of its congregation for many, many years. 
Uh, christened here at the church is C.C. Goodwin's mother, Jane Thorncroft Jackson. Uh, also C.C. and all of his siblings, George, Elias, William, Jane, and Henry. Married here in this church were Phoebe's mother, Elizabeth Trotman, to Cottrell Ballard. And possibly buried here are C.C. Goodwin's mother, Jane uh, Jackson, Phoebe Goodwin's mother, Elizabeth Ballard, and Phoebe Goodwin's stepfather, Cottrell Ballard. The reason I say possibly buried here is because these graveyards of these old, old churches in England and in Wales are constantly churning the bodies that are buried in them. Uh, look around, you'll notice that the, the graveyard is the same size that it's been for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the gravestones are still fairly spread out. And yet, for over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands and thousands of parishioners have been buried here. And the way that works is every so often, the church will dig up the old graves and store the bones and then uh, make room for new graves to be put in there. And record keeping was very poor, so it's often difficult to know exactly where a person is buried in England and Wales. It is not, however, difficult to know where William Shakespeare is buried because he was so afraid of his bones being dug up and stuck in one of these storage chambers, you know, after he had died, that he insisted on having his body buried under the floor of the church where it could never be dug up and his bones would lay in peace for eternity. I mentioned earlier that C.C. and Phoebe's families had lived down in the area of Holy Trinity Church over many years as they were growing up. We walked these streets with the original buildings still standing and still occupied, and were able to find the specific houses for a couple of them. In 1841, the Goodwins lived on College Lane. We don't know the exact street address. The 1841 census really doesn't get into that much detail, but we do know that it was between Bull Street and Ryland Street. Ten years later, in 1851, the family had moved just about a block away to number 30 Ryland Street. We did not get a photograph of it while we were there, but Google Street View shows it, and it looks like this. By 1861, CC was 21 years old and had moved to Coventry, but the house here on Ryland Street continued to be occupied by the Goodwin family and was still occupied by the Goodwins in 1871. And although neither William nor Jane was alive at the time of the 1881 census, Jane died just months before, and I'm convinced that she lived there until her death in 1881. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about Phoebe Chambers' family. Uh, we don't have any record of Phoebe actually living in Stratford-upon-Avon, but soon after she left and got married, her mother, Elizabeth Trotman, got remarried to a man named Cotterell Ballard, and that, that couple moved to Stratford-upon-Avon, settling in 1860 or 61 at 41 Henley Street, across the street from the Shakespeare House. By 1871, they had moved down onto College Lane and lived just a few doors down from the church there. Uh, we were delighted to find that house. It's still there and uh, took some pictures around it. By 1881 to her death, they moved onto Evesham Road. That house also still exists and it looks like this today. You heard me mention that both C.C. Goodwin and Phoebe Chambers left Stratford-upon-Avon at a fairly early age. As it turns out, they both moved to the city of Coventry, about 25 miles northeast of Stratford-upon-Avon. They moved independently of each other. Phoebe was the first to move. When she was 16 years old, she got married to a man from Coventry whose name is Joseph Deacon. Um, they had a baby, and uh, soon thereafter, uh, Joseph Deacon died. Uh, I don't know exactly what he died of, but uh, Phoebe was left a widow with a small baby living with her in-laws in Coventry. And by 1861, she was 23 years old, and making her a living as a dressmaker. And it was under these circumstances that she came to know a neighbor, 21-year-old C.C. Goodwin, who was living several blocks away and working as a sign painter. Within months of meeting Phoebe, C.C. became converted to the Mormon religion. And then in July of 1862, C.C. and Phoebe were married in Birmingham's St. Jude Church. They lived and worked in Birmingham uh, for the next couple of years, saving up their money. 
Then in 1864, they were finally able to take a ship from England to Utah, where they settled in the Cache Valley city of Logan. We had a chance to visit Hill Street, the street that CC lived on, and uh, what's listed here as Bab Lake School uh, later became referred to as Bonds Hospital, which was pretty much right next door to where he lived. He did not live in it, but uh, right next to it. Uh, and then we also visited uh, St. John's Church there. We spent some time on Spawn Street right below it, uh, which still looks very uh, period in its architecture. We were not able to visit Albion Street where Phoebe lived because in the 60s, Albion Street was torn down and it is currently the site of Coventry's very own Ikea. Coventry was heavily bombed in World War II uh, multiple times. On one time alone, 500 German bombers dropped 150,000 incendiary bombs on top of Coventry. That took out 27 factories, killed 568 people, and 60,000 buildings were destroyed, including the Coventry Cathedral. We took a few minutes to visit the bombed out ruin of Coventry Cathedral, as well as the Holy Trinity Church next door, and it was a beautiful reminder of the impact of the war. And I think the beauty of the moment was increased by the fact that the clouds had just dropped a little bit of rain and the sky was still cloudy and it was a beautiful evening. Let's wrap up our discussion of the Goodwin family by visiting another little town. About five miles downstream from Stratford-upon-Avon is the little town of Welford-on-Avon. It's also on the Avon River. You're looking at Church Street here, which seemed to me to be set in another era. Welford on Avon is the hometown and birthplace of Phoebe Goodwin, Cece's wife, and also her mother, Elizabeth Trotman, and her grandmother, Elizabeth Shervington, who is also buried in Welford at St. Peter's Parish Church. Also from Welford is Phoebe's father, Clifford Chambers, and her stepfather, Cotterell Ballard. Those two guys were actually neighbors of each other.
We had a wonderful time retracing the footsteps of the Goodwin family in Stratford-on-Avon, in Coventry, and in Welford-on-Avon. Next, let's talk about Richard Henry Wickham and that whole branch of the family. I've not written a biography about Richard Wickham. I will at some point, and I'll put it on my website, and perhaps by the time you see this, I will have finished it, and it'll be on my website. In the last chapter, I mentioned that Harry Goodwin's wife, Alice Wickham, that we'd be coming back to her story, and this is that story. So I'm going to switch the picture now so you can see her ancestry. Similar to the last chapter, I'm going to explore the Wickham line, Richard Wickham and his parents, and then we'll come back and explore the Graham line, Ellen Graham and her parents. Again, those people that are in red boxes converted to Mormonism and emigrated to Utah. Those in the dark boxes at the bottom were born in America. Let's start by orienting ourselves. This is an 1832 map of the London area. The red circle is London itself. Uh, here's where the Tower of London is. Here's where Big Ben would eventually be. It actually wouldn't be built for another 27 years. Here's where Buckingham Palace is. We're going to focus, though, on Kent, which is the lower right-hand quadrant. Kent is bounded by a green color, starting from the south shore of the Thames. Let's zoom in. This is the area of interest for the Wickham family. Richard Wickham was born in East Wickham, his father in Welling. Richard Wickham's wife was born in Plumstead. Her grandfather was born in Rotherhithe. This is the area that we focused on. And it was largely rural. These, are, these were farmers. You can tell those little black dots, those are individual houses. There are very few houses back then. Now that's all changed in the modern era. Um, and I'll overlay a map of modern London here so you can get a sense of how things have changed. But before I do that, notice all the marshes across the top. The Isle of Dogs, the things that are above the Thames River there, the Plumstead Marshes, almost all that's been filled in with the modern world. And here, practice butt, that's where we stayed. <laughs> Thankfully, they've changed the name of practice butt. It's no longer called that. It's called Thames Mead. And we stayed at a lovely high-rise apartment there overlooking the Thames River. My great-great-grandfather, Richard Henry Wickham, was born in 1843 in a neighborhood of Welling with the interesting name of Shoulder of Mutton Green, due to its shape, as you can see here on this 1832 map. I presume his home was in this cluster of dwellings here. He was christened at nearby St. Michael's Church, which you can see is marked with a cross here. When Richard was six years old, his parents were converted to Mormonism, and so when he was eight, he too was baptized as a Mormon. Richard's father, John Wickham, was born in Sussex, about 60 miles south, but was farming at Shoulder of Mutton Green by the age of 29 in 1830. He married Sarah Andrews at St. Mary Magdalene Church in Woolwich in 1834. We had a chance to visit the church, which still exists today and overlooks the Thames River. John and Sarah Wickham raised their family of 11 in the same home on Shoulder of Mutton Green, living there for over 30 years. Converted to Mormonism at the age of 49, they eventually emigrated to Utah when he was 64 years old, after most of their children had already emigrated and were able to send money home. Their faith must have been pretty bright to pick up and leave their homeland to start a new life in Zion well into their 60s. They settled in Moroni, Utah, where he died seven years later. 19-year-old Richard, his son and my great-great-grandfather, had actually left for Utah three years before his parents, and on the ship crossing the ocean was a pretty 13-year-old girl named Ellen Graham. She too came from a Mormon family from nearby Plumstead. They would be married before the year was out. Richard and Ellen settled in Brigham City, and uh, she bore him five children. Uh, unfortunately, she died in a tragic farm accident several years later, and he remarried to Mary Louisa Lloyd and had an additional eight children with her. I think this is a good time to talk about Woolwich a bit more. Woolwich was the home of the Royal Dockyard, the place where England's naval ships were built and repaired since the time of Henry VIII. It was also the home of the Royal Arsenal, where the armaments and ammunition were manufactured. The barracks are still in use today, though the arsenal and dockyard were closed several years ago. But back in the 1800s, it was a huge enterprise and a big part of England's dominance of the seas at the time. The 1861 census indicated that 10-year-old Ellen was employed at the Royal Arsenal as a cartridge maker. 
You can see St. Mary Magdalene Church where John and Sarah Wickham were married next to the dockyard in this 1790 painting. That church also figures prominently in the Graham family. Ellen Graham was christened there. Her father, Frederick Graham, was married there twice. Frederick Graham was converted to Mormonism as a newly married 21-year-old in 1848, but his wife, Elizabeth, was not a fan of the Mormon church and opposed his involvement. When she passed away young, he married a woman from his LDS branch, Mary Ann Jackson. By the way, this same Frederick Graham was born and raised in Welling. Remember Welling, the home of the Wickhams? and christened in the same St. Michael's Church as Richard Henry Wickham. It makes me wonder if these families' lives were intertwined for many years before two of their own got married. We also had a chance to visit the parish church of William Graham, my fifth great-grandfather. He was christened across town in the beautiful and historic St. Mary's Church in Rotherhithe. This church is famous the world over because it's the final resting place of Christopher Jones, captain of the Mayflower. My wife's ancestry includes one of the Mayflower's passengers, Resolved White. You're listening to music being played on its original organ. Let's start our review of the trip to Wales with James Purser, my great-great-grandfather. We'll also talk about other members of his family, other Pursers and other ancestors, but uh, we'll center it around James. Much of what we'll discuss, I've also written about in a biography I wrote about James Purser, which you can find on my website. Pembroke County, or Pembrokeshire as it's called, is the area marked in green on this map. And the area shown in red is the end of a natural waterway called Milford Haven, in which there's a town called Pembroke, Pembroke Dock, and another town called Cautiston and Laurany, all of which are important in the history of the Purser family. My great-great-grandfather, James Purser and his father, and in fact five generations of Pursers, were all born within five miles of this little town called Cautiston. Here you see a modern map of the area of interest, uh, Cautiston in the center. Um, if we look at the family history here from the top, Francis Purser, 1701, he was born in Pulkrocken, there on the left, uh, on the south side of the main river there on the left. Uh, we don't know where he was, where he died, but his son William, 1733, was also born in Pulkrocken, but then uh, lived much of his life in Cautiston, and that's when the family sort of settled in Cautiston. Uh, Stephen Purser, Francis Purser, James Purser, and Lewis Purser, all born and raised in Cautiston, christened in the St. Michael and All Angels Church. Right there, we had a chance to visit that. The wives of the Pursers were also local. Uh, we don't actually know where Alice Carew was born, but she did marry Francis Purser in Pulkrocken. Anna Goodman was from Cautiston. Sarah Phillips was born in the little town of St. Florence, which you can see on the bottom right-hand area of this map. Francis Anan was born in Laurany, which is in the upper left-hand side, just above Cautiston on the other side of the river. Rebecca Nash was born in the coal town of Begley, which is in the upper right part of this map. Here we've zoomed in on some key areas of interest in the life of James Purser. Uh, we'll get to each of these in time, but this is basically on the right-hand side, in, uh, circled in red there is Cautiston and its environs, with asterisks by each of the houses that the Pursers lived in over the course of the various censuses in Wales. James lived the first 41 years of his life within 100 yards of the water. At the time of his birth, his father was what was then referred to as a waterman someone who made his living on the water. In the winter, he dredged the river for oysters, and in the summer, he transported wheat with his 18-ton vessel from the port downriver to the mill upriver. James and his brothers would often accompany their father. 
and his sister, Louisa, later wrote of her fond memories as a little girl living on the water's edge, collecting shells. And as you can see, there were plenty of shells to be found on the shores of Milford Haven. In the course of researching their lives, I have inspected dozens of maps. I've spent hours looking at photos and satellite images of Cautiouston and all the area around it. Um, this trip to Wales uh, had gave me a chance to look in person at this area. And what strikes me is how little has changed in hundreds of years. To this day, there's the same fields, hedgerows, hamlets, and paths, the same roads, the same place names. You know, as an American, I keep looking for new housing subdivisions, uh, shopping centers, business districts, you know, any sign of progress. But you're hard pressed to find any evidence of the modern world here. Not in Cautiouston, nor in Laurigny, uh, nor in Nayland across the river, the very places James spent the first half of his life. So for example, here is modern day Cautiouston on a Google Earth image. I'm gonna zoom in here on the, that's actually St. Michael and All Angels Church that I'm you know, targeting there, but that's Cautiouston today. And it doesn't look any different than it did in the 1800s. Okay, there's one new little small subdivision in there. Now let's pan up the coast to, uh, you know, across the Cautiouston area. And you'll see, I'm gonna zoom in here on the Ferry Alley area where James Purser lived back in the 1800s, and it has essentially unchanged as well. It's really just amazing how little things have changed in the Cautiouston area over the years. One more example, I found this drone footage off uh, on YouTube, and that's Laurigny, the little town there at the bottom. Uh, I'll freeze there on the church in the very bottom center, you can see that. Uh, and uh, we'll pan around here and I'll stop it right there. That is um, Milford Haven. And the Pursers lived on the other side of that river there um, uh, along the edges of Cautiouston. And look at it today. I mean, where are the shopping centers? Where's Safeway or Tesco, you know, the British version? It's just really amazing to me how this land has stayed as pristine uh, and agrarian uh, today as it was in the time of my ancestors. Even the big town where James and his wife Rebecca would begin their life together, Pembroke Dock, it's just four miles from his birthplace, but it hasn't changed that much either. Oh yeah, there's a bridge across the river now, and there's a science and technology park, and there's a McDonald's, which we ate at several times. But the residential core of the town is largely unchanged. The same row houses on the same strip lots that have been there seemingly forever. This apparent lack of change is all the more amazing to me in light of the prodigious reproductive capabilities of my 19th century ancestors. In researching their lives, I've cataloged about 100 different families related to James Purser, and it seems that each family had six to 10 children. And weirdly, they all seem to have the same set of about 10 names, William, James, Thomas, John, Elizabeth, Eliza, Esther, Mary, Anne, and Margaret. Where did all their descendants go? I mean, this is family after family, and this is I'm just talking about one family in this area. There were many families. Where are the descendants? At the rate they were breeding, the entire countryside should look like suburbia by this point, but it doesn't. You know, if you compare a detailed map of the area published by the government in 1862 with a Google satellite image taken over 150 years later, Cautiouston has not changed. Look at that again. Not only are the fields in the same location, but the forests and the hedges are in the same location. The size of the towns or, or the little where the houses are has not changed. Uh, really nothing about this has changed in over 160 years. This is probably a, a good time for us to talk about where we stayed when we were there. Uh, you see the center area, it's labeled Upton. And you can see here also on this map, Upton and Upton Castle is mentioned right next to it. And that's where we stayed. Upton Castle was built in the 12th century. Over time, it was uh, turned into a manor house, basically. Uh, so it's a fancy old, old house with a uh, castle attached to it and an old chapel as well. And the owners have turned it into an Airbnb. Uh, they rent out one of the rooms in it. Unfortunately, it was Easter weekend, so their family was in town. We were not able to rent the the, the room in the castle itself, but they also have a uh, just a you know 100 200 yards away uh, what's called the Upton Cottage, which was uh, built by the family that 
owned the Upton, um, you know, castle back in the eight, uh, the 1700s. And uh, so we stayed in it. It's a beautiful house, really well kept. Um, it's off the grid, as they say, no electricity except for solar. Um, the rooms were heated with uh, radiators that were heated with a wood stove uh, down in the that was down in the kitchen that we had to keep stoked, um, and I think it really enhanced our experience there because not only were we right next door to the castle and the the people who own and run the castle could not have been more welcoming to us. We would run into them all the time as we were, you know, going into or out of or walking around the grounds. They're very welcoming. Uh, but not only the castle was interesting, but also being able to stay in this little cottage uh, out that it really gave us the sense of what Cautiston was like back when the Pursers lived there. The cottage was basically on one side of it was a giant sheep grazing field and on the other side was uh, some woods with trails through it that went down to the river. One other thing interesting about the castle is the chapel that sits on it. The chapel was built back in 1200 something uh, and still uh, it's still there today. It's still in use today. There's a church service every Sunday there and the earliest known owners of the castle, the Malifants, are entombed in it and you can see their effigies uh, the husband and the wife in the chapel itself it was a lovely uh, piece of history uh, right next door to where we were staying we just had a great time in upton at upton castle well let's get to it let's start talking about our our actual trip there and what we saw and learned about our family the first morning our first full morning in the cautiston area we uh, we had just gotten in that night to the uh, the castle that we were staying at, and uh, so we spent the morning sort of walking around the grounds and taking a lot of pictures and video and that kind of stuff, and uh, then started our day proper with a lunch meeting with my fifth cousin, Brian Purser, a relative, right? Um, a Purser who lives I don't know five or six miles from Cautiston, and uh, he and I had become acquainted because we were, were both active on Ancestry.com, and I, I saw that he was doing a lot of Purser genealogy work. So uh, we started chatting uh, on Ancestry.com, and when I learned that I was going to be going to Wales, we found a reason to get together. And we met at the Brewery Inn in Cautiston, had a wonderful lunch with him and his wife Sue, uh, and of course my dad, Leslie, and Peggy. Um, we just really uh, enjoyed meeting somebody who has a common interest and that we share common blood with. Immediately after lunch, Brian and Sue uh, guided us over to St. Michael and All Angels Church. St. Michael and All Angels Church is really ground zero for the religious activities of the Purser family prior to their Mormonism anyway. James Purser was christened there, as were all of his siblings. His father, Francis Purser, and all of his siblings. His grandfather, Stephen Purser, and his great-grandfather, William Purser, all christened at St. Michael and All Angels Church. So there was something kind of special to see this font in the church and know that you know, 16 of my ancestors across multiple generations had been christened in that very font. Oh, and Brian told me that he also, as a baby, was christened at this very same font. Also married there were James's parents, Francis and Francis. Uh, they were married in 1839 in this church, and his grandparents, Stephen Purser and wife Mary, were married in this church as well. Um, as far as burials go, I'm not 100% sure of the burials. James's grandfather, Stephen Purser, who died in 1843, and great-grandfather, William Purser, who died in 1784, may be buried at this cemetery. One of the things that we saw immediately at St. Michael and All Angels Church, and that we saw at every other church um, cemetery in Wales and England was that the the words on the gravestones, the headstones, is off, have been pretty much obscured by the ravages of time and weather, by the growth of moss and lichen and other items on it, so that it's very difficult 
if not impossible, to read anything on a um, on a headstone that's more than about 80 years old. We did not go with the intent of, you know, meticulously searching through gra- graveyards to find specific graves of specific relatives. So it was not a huge disappointment. It's very pic- picturesque, but nonetheless, I'm not going to be able to show you any, you know, amazing finds in the graveyards of England and Wales. That said, we did find one in Laurany, which I'll show you, of a, uh, a fairly close relative that was uh, we were kind of excited to see. After we left St. Michael and All Angels Church, Brian Purser uh, guided us up to the north part of the island where the Pursers had lived uh, all those many years ago. Uh, and on this previous map, you've seen me with these, uh, these areas here, Welcome in 1841, Laurany Ferry Road, 1851, Ferry Hill, 1871. These are the names of the uh, places where James Purser lived in the various censuses in 1841, 51, and 71. You'll see on the far left, uh, 1861, he he lived with his wife in uh, Pembroke Dock where they uh, had been married. Well, anyway, we went up here to the north part of the island and looked at these various neighborhoods where he had lived. A brief note about where these houses really are. Truth be told, I don't know exactly which house they're in. The census does not have an address uh, it talks about like a neighborhood or an area, uh, and these are the names, Welcome, Ferry Hill, and Laurany Ferry Road, but it doesn't name a specific house or location. Um, the fact is, I mean, if we look on a map that from 1862, there are very few lodgings or dwellings in this area. The, the houses are these little black or very dark uh, squares and rectangles here. Um, and there were very few of them, so um, we can make some educated guesses based on the uh, the census data as to which house or where they actually lived. But in fact, I don't know the specific houses. So you're going to see some video here of the neighborhoods and the areas, which may or may not be the exact houses. In 1841, uh, the census occurred just days before James was born, and the uh, census shows that uh, Francis and his wife lived there in Welcome. Now, on the on the census, it's marked, it's spelled H O I L C O M B E, and so that uh, that actually threw me for a bit. But if you look around on the census sheets before and after, um, you can see that. Yeah, this is welcome. The census taker simply didn't know how to spell it, and so they spelled it the best they could. Uh, welcome is this cluster of houses here. Um, there are five or six of them. Not sure which one the uh, Francis and his wife might have lived in. You do see right there on the water next to Welcome something called Chemical Works, and you can see video here of the Chemical Works building that still exists. It's been converted to a private home. The Chemical Works did not exist at the time that uh, Francis lived in Welcome. It was built in the, the 1860s or something like that. So that big building is not where they lived, but it's often referred to as part of Welcome. Welcome has changed very little since James Purser was born here in 1841. This view looks west from Welcome, which sits on the south shore of Milford Haven. In the distance is Nayland, the town where James Purser and his family would leave when he emigrated to Utah 42 years later. Then in 1851 census, um, we see that the family lived in Laurany, on Laurany Ferry Road, as it's called. Now, uh, this is when James was about 10 years old, and uh, the Laurany Ferry Road is the road that takes you to the Laurany Ferry. It's shown here. The end of the road is uh, the Dock Inn. Today, the building that is there is called the Ferry House, but it's in the same location, and it was once called the Dock Inn. Now, this is at the end of the road. We don't know if the Pursers lived in the Dock Inn or some other place along the road. But we do know that the Purser home was right near Laurany Ferry because the Mormon missionaries, as they went uh, between Cautiston and Laurany, would cross at Laurany Ferry and would stop in and have a meal or stay over with the Pursers who uh, lived right there at Laurany Ferry. And then in 1871, 
James Purser is a, you know, he's a father with a family. We see on the census, here he is on Ferry Hill. Ferry Hill is just adjacent to what is referred to as the alley. We walked along the river below Ferry Hill and could see the alley, this uh, set of houses up above us. And uh, then we actually found our way up and, and toured down the street of the alley as well. I don't know if any of these homes is one that James lived in, but it was in this area on Ferry Hill that he and his family lived in 1871. We visited the alley and uh, you see some of the homes that are still there. The oldest home is the first one here on the left. At least this is what the, the folks that lived there told us. Uh, these homes have been there forever. Some of them, oh, over time they've been upgraded. They maybe have been um, uh, even raised and a new house put on them, but on the same foundation. One thing that I thought was interesting to note is that the uh, residents who lived there told us that this, the, the small room there on the left of the first house was originally the piggery. So let's cross the estuary of the Cladau River there, north of Cautiuston, to the little town of Laurigny a town that's even smaller than Cautiuston. And I also want to take a slight diversion to one of the families here, the Anans. Uh, Francis Anan was married to Francis Purser. And you can see I've uh, put her uh, ancestors above, James Anan, William Anan, and Theophilus Anan. These all were uh, born and raised in the town of Laurigny. The reason I'm mentioning them is because they were part of the Mormon conversion and migration story that affected the Pursers, as we'll discuss later, and also because we had a chance to visit Laurigny and to visit the church where they were baptized and married, and some of them buried. James Purser's mother, Frances Purser, was an Anan from Laurigny. Her family had lived there for several generations. Many of the family religious ordinances took place at the Laurigny Parish Church St. Caradoc, which we had a chance to uh, visit. Baptized at this church were Frances herself and her siblings, her father James, her, fa her grandfather William, and her great-grandfather Theophilus, and no doubt many, many more. The baptismal font still exists. You can see it here. Apparently it's not being used anymore, but they've put it to a good purpose. Married here were her parents, James and Elizabeth, and her grandparents, William and Elizabeth. And buried here uh, are her great-grandfather, Theophilus, her grandfather, William, her grandmother, Elizabeth, but her mother is not buried her, here. Her mother died emigrating to the U.S. I mentioned earlier that when we were in Laurigny at the church that we found a gravestone that provided new insight um, and it was really kind of exciting. We came across this gravestone and we're, we were pleased to be able to read it, although it took quite a bit of effort to do so. This is the gravestone of Fanny Einan's uncle, John Einan. And this is what it says. In loving remembrance of John Einan, died November 17th, 1873, aged 69 years. Also of his children, James, John, Mary, Sarah, who died in their childhood, also of his son, Richard, who died August 11th, 1890, aged 42 years. The reason why this was uh, special to us is because it included information about people, children of John Einan, who we did not know about on Ancestry.com or FamilySearch.org. Uh, these children who had died in their infancy, they probably never showed up on a census, but here they are on the gravestone, and it provided new insight into a family that we really thought was special. Now is probably a good time to introduce uh, Mormonism and how it affected the Purser and Anan families. Uh, James's parents, Francis and Fanny, were married in 1839. And in 1846, Fanny's father in Laurigny, uh, James Anan and his sister Louisa Anan were converted to Mormonism by traveling missionaries that had visited their home. Fanny and Francis also joined the church about that time. 
Several months later, Fanny's mother Elizabeth was also baptized, and then other members of the extended Anan family were also converted. Ultimately, there were about 20 of them that converted. Fanny's parents and her three youngest sisters emigrated to America in 1849. Unfortunately, both of Fanny's parents died before they reached Utah. Uh, Elizabeth Anan of Cholera on the Missouri River and James Anan of Cholera in the pioneer camp in Iowa City the next year. That's why her mother and father are not buried in Laurini. They, they're buried in America. The three adult sisters eventually married Mormon men and each of them settled in Cache County, Utah. Uh, back in Wales, Francis and Fanny and their children joined the church. James's sister, Louisa, reported being baptized by her father at the age of eight. His brother, Philip, wrote that their father had baptized him at the age of nine. We don't have a record specifically of James saying when he was baptized, but I'm confident that he was baptized when he came of age. In the 1860s, James's family uh, his siblings and parents began emigrating to Utah. First his younger sister and then the rest of the family um, with his parents and all of his younger siblings except for him by 1868 had emigrated to Utah. James and his family stayed in Wales until 1883 at which point they too emigrated to Utah. When James and Rebecca Purser landed in Utah they settled in Hyde Park Utah, about four miles north of Logan, and it was a natural choice for the Pursers to settle there. When they arrived in 1883, they joined ten other Purser families in Cache Valley, including the families of all five of his living siblings, his father Francis, two of his mother's sisters, and two additional Anan cousins. All told, 50 relatives lived within five miles of James, Rebecca, and their seven children. And there were also clusters of his relatives in St. Charles, Idaho and Malad, Idaho, both about 50 miles away. Mormonism has been active in Wales for over 170 years. Today, the LDS Church maintains two stakes and 15 congregations in Wales, including a branch in Milford Haven, just four miles from the Purser's last home. In 2012, the Milford Haven branch constructed a chapel, the first LDS chapel ever in Pembrokeshire, and we had a chance to visit when we were there. Well, let's get back to our time in Wales. We also had a chance to uh, visit the town, the nearby town of Pembroke Dock and visit the Church of St. John the Evangelist, which is where James Purser and Rebecca Nash were married in December of 1860. You may recall that we were in Wales for Easter Sunday, and we debated between four different places where we might go to church on Easter Sunday. We could go to the local little chapel at Upton Castle, right by where we were staying, or we could go into Pembroke Dock and go to church in the St. John the Evangelist Church where James Purser and Rebecca Nash were married. We could go to the LDS branch, which is about four miles away, or we could go up about a 40-mile drive to a big cathedral in a place called St. David's. Ultimately, we decided to go to St. David's. I'm really glad we did. And I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm going to take a few minutes and take a diversion into our most amazing experience that we had at St. David's Cathedral on Easter Sunday. As I mentioned, it's about a 40-minute drive from Cautiston to St. David's. St. David's is on the furthest west point of the country of Wales. St. David's Head is shown right there. And we actually went and visited St. David's Head and took a walk out there. And I'll show you a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. Just about a mile or two from St. David's Head is the little city of St. David's, which has a cathedral right in the middle of it. The cathedral is very old. Uh, it was uh, begun in 1181 and completed not long after that and became famous right away. William the Conqueror, uh, visited it. And back in 1123, the Pope at the time decreed that two pilgrimages to St. David's is equal to one to Rome and three pilgrimages to one to Jerusalem. And as a result, the cathedral became very rich from the pilgrimage trade. We attended a very inspiring and uplifting Easter service in there, full of music and a wonderful sermon. The part where the congregation sat for the service was actually quite small. 
So when the service was over, while the organ was playing the lead-out music and the crowd was exiting out the front door, I decided to take a little bit of a sightseeing trip deeper into the cathedral to see the rest of it and discovered how really magnificent and huge it is. It is an old cathedral, and you can really sense that as you go through it. The organ echoing through the cathedral as I walked around the rest of the cathedral really added a lot to the experience. I just walked silently around the entire building, looking into each room. As you can see, the cathedral is full of various smaller chapels throughout. I'm not sure exactly what the purpose of each one is, but they're smaller chapels. This one uh, was just beautiful. You can see the back side of the organ there. That's on the other side of that organ where the main service was. And I'm going to pan up here. It's hard to tell from the video, but when I pan straight up, you're actually in the underside of the great tower of the cathedral, and that's the ceiling way, way up there, um, you know, 80 feet or 100 feet or however tall that, that is. It was really quite beautiful. Loving this. I don't know if you recognize the tune that he's been playing, but it's variations on Now Thank We All Our God. And as I was, uh, I was just loving it, but as I came around the corner to sort of exit the, uh, the backside of the cathedral, I saw these big red tubes here. You can see them in front of you. These are the subwoofers, the 20 and 25 and 32 foot pipes that are these those low, low rumbling notes. And this organist was loving his job this day because he was pumping as much through as he possibly could through those tubes. You'll notice that building up on the top of the hill there, that's the bell tower. It's kind of unusual, I think. I've never seen this before, but the bell tower was built in the 1400s to house the bells of the cathedral. So the tower of the cathedral itself doesn't have any bells in it. Well, thanks for spending a few minutes on St. David's Cathedral. It was just a wonderful and beautiful experience. Really glad we went. When we were done with the Easter service there, uh, we decided to take a walk along the Welsh coast. And so uh, we drove a, a mile or two to uh, a place called St. David's Head. Uh, actually, a path to St. David's Head. We started at the 
parking lot and then walked, I don't know what it was, two miles or something off to the, to the end of the point and then back again. That's it. I wasn't able to share with you everything that we did, so I'll close with a few highlights, and thanks for watching.